Today, as I said, I'm going to speak on the story of Nicodemus. But what I want to do first is do the Bible reading, and then I want to give you a little bit of a history lesson on the children of Israel, because as we read the story, we realise that there's a, a little history lesson from the Old Testament in it. So I'm going to read from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. Before I do, I'm just going to pray. So I'll um, uh, just ask that we pray as we read God's Word. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you we're here tonight. Lord, to hear from you. Lord, we're going to read your word now. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that your, your word is a lamp unto our feet. It guides us and it leads us. And Lord, we ask through your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you'll speak to each one of us, myself included, Lord, that as we hear these words, Lord, you'll speak into our lives. Lord, we thank you for this story of Nicodemus and the importance of knowing that each one of us here, Lord, can't rely on our parents, we can't rely on religion, we can't rely on money, we can't rely on doctors or anybody else. We have to rely on Jesus and have a personal relationship with him and be born again. So Lord, I pray that you'll speak to each one of us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so John chapter 3, it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, which was the Sanhedrin. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one has performed the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so what I want to do first is to look at that verse when Jesus said, as, Mo as Moses had put up the servant in the wilderness. Because there's a story in the Old Testament, and later on there will be a special guest coming in my time war machine, hopefully. But I, there's a story in the Old Testament that talks about the children of Israel. They grumble and they complain before God. And then God put these snakes all through the camp and people just got bitten. They just kept getting bitten and bitten and people were dying and they didn't know what to do. And so Moses cried out to God and God supplied a way. And um, I'm hoping that my um, guest has come through his time more people. Oh, here he is. Oh, oh hello. Um, oh. Um, Jono. Yes. From the tribe of Judah. That's right. What's, yes. what's happened, my friend? Oh, I've been bitten by this snake. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, my thumb, right at the end of my thumb. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. What? Well, my arm's starting to swell and oh, it's throbbing a bit. Well, don't panic. Whatever you do, don't panic. All right, right. I'll get your seat. Okay. This, this is no, serious. I'm going to panic. Are you all right? Yeah, that's a snake. Oh, wait, just, can you see it? Um, yeah, I yeah. do. Um, what would Moses do? Oh, he'd do, wouldn't he? <laughs> right, sorry. That's cool. Um, um, Israeli, children of Israel, snake survival kit. Yep, cool, got it. Right, number one. Oh, don't panic. Oh, uh, don't panic, you right? Cool, don't panic. Yeah, said that, I'll, I'll stop panicking. Right, don't panic. Right, yeah. now, now uh, cut the wound and suck out the blood. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I've got it. <laughs> right. I've used this before. 
Um, so, fishing knife? Yeah, like a fishing one. Is that right? Oh, actually, we need anaesthetic, don't we? Oh, maybe. Look, let's skip that one. I'll skip that one. Um, uh, do you want to suck it out? No, 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 I'm not up for that. <laughs> I don't think I can decide that. Oh, um, oh, um, cut the word and suck it out. Oh, let's skip that. We'll just skip, alright, and um, apply a tourniquet. Um, oh, I reckon I've got something. John, I've got something. This is not from fishing. This is this is um this is from my rope trick, but anyway, I'm trying to just write a rope trick. Um, so um, we should put a tie. Where it's gonna stop? I'll just put it there. I'll put it. Actually, I'll put it up there because that's what that's what the nurse yeah. does. And they take the blood. All right. I'll put that there. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. No. Not. It's not terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's turning green. Oh. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, Immobilise the lid. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Right, if you put your arm on there, just sort of rest it on there a bit. This there, right? Mm -hmm. That's still alive. Look. Anyway, right, right, hang on. Don't, don't cut, cut the wind. No, no, don't do it. Apply the, apply the tool, okay? Mobilise the lead. Don't panic. What do they keep saying that for? Don't panic. Um, I think it's because you're uh, Oh, hang on. It says read numbers 21. Okay, hold well, Read numbers 21. It says, well, this is about you guys. Numbers 21. Okay, it says, the bronze snake. It says, the children of Israel, you guys, they travelled from Mount Hor along the route of the Red Sea to go around Eden. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water. You remember all that? You must be naughty because you were bitten. Anyway, it said, Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many died, except for John. Yeah. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, This is the important bit, Make a snake, put it on a pole, Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, then when anyone was bitten by the snake, they looked at it and they lived. Can you give it a go? I've got it. I've got this right. 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 Actually, my version said rubber snake. So, no more bomb. There's a different rubber version. Snake. Rubber, snake. Yeah, rubber snake. So, all right. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Right. So Moses took a rubber snake and used his two dead socks. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Put it on a pole. <laughs> Put it on a pole. And then he's at the look. Is it working? Do you feel it? Yeah. I think the throbbing's going away. Wow. You look better too. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not as green anymore. Yeah, well, I'll take the tonic off you better. You feel better. Yeah. You feel good? Yeah. You're feeling it? Yeah. So I'm saying the tonic over it. You're feeling it? Yeah. Great. Yeah. You're feeling so much better. Well, that's great. Well, it worked. Well, thank you. Come on. From the trot. Ooh, from the trot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll leave that there to remind us. I'll leave that there. <laughs> okay, so thank you, John, for doing that little illustration because that is going to help us to understand this story today. So, if I'm my Bible. Now, what I want to do now is to backtrack a little bit and go to the story of Nicodemus and actually look at that story because Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee was one of those religious leaders of Israel and he held the teachings of the Old Testament and particularly was a uh, very strong about the Sabbath. They couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. And remember when um, the children of Israel were given the, the Ten Commandments? Well, the Pharisees had managed and the Sadducees had managed to extend them to well over 300 commandments from the original Ten. 
So there was a lot more commandments, particularly around the Sabbath. There were so many things you couldn't do on that day. The over-the-top interpretation of the law had no appeal to the majority of the Israeli people at that time. And attendance at the synagogue on the Sabbath was important. If you didn't come, you were in trouble. And then you've got the Sadducees. It says he was a Pharisee and a Sadducee. So who were the Sadducees? They were the rich landowners. They were upper class Pharisees. They were seen as rather boorish by the down and outers. And they were very rude to their peers. They looked and hung around the rich and the famous. So if the Sadducees would be here today, they probably would be all living in Hollywood, hanging around the rich and famous. That's how it was. They didn't hang around the ordinary people, they just hang around the rich and famous. And they believed in the first five books of the Bible and that was it. And they didn't want to, sorry. They didn't want to have anything to do. Let's up a bit. They didn't want to have anything to do with Christ, with Jesus. Because they thought we've got the first five books of the Bible and that's all we need. And that's what they stuck with, the first five books of the Bible. So very religious, strictly adhering to rules and regulations. They dressed differently, they stood out, and they hang around with the rich and famous. So what does the, the New Testament tell us about Nicodemus? Well, it says that he came at night. He came to Jesus at night. Now, there could be a number of reasons because he needed to have that time with Jesus, but it's probably because he was scared of his peers. And my question to the, to, today or tonight is, am I a night Christian? Do people know that I'm a Christian? See, the people knew who Nicodemus was, and he didn't want to change that outlook of what people thought of him. And so he came to Jesus at night. And I see so many people as I walk through life. You go to a workplace or something and you talk about something, and they, the first thing they say, oh, I didn't know he was a Christian. I didn't know she was a Christian. And I think that's a very sad indictment on people today, that they're, not, they're, they're afraid to share their faith, they're afraid to stand up and say that they're a Christian. And so they become a night Christian. They don't let people know their faith. They don't let people know about what Jesus has done in their life. And it makes it very hard for the gospel to be shared with others if you don't share it. I remember as a, when I first became a Christian, my first rule was that whenever I changed work, because I used to change quite often as I was moving around in SA Health, the first thing I did was I let people know I was a Christian. And I, and I made it quite clear that that was, my, that was where I stood. And the other thing I used to do on Monday, and I used to encourage people to do it, was, did you have a good weekend? I used to say, yeah, I went to church. I didn't say, yeah, I went to the footy. Because that's the best way to start a conversation about your Christian faith, just by saying, yeah, I went to church. And it used to work for me all the time. And the Easter time, at Christmas time, I used to ask my boss, and if I wasn't the boss, to put something in the newsletter about Christmas and about Easter. Quite easy. Nothing, um, you know, in your face, but just something just to share with my colleagues about my Christian faith. And it wasn't hard. I enjoyed doing it. And I enjoyed being open and honest with my colleagues at work. So let's pray that they're not one of those Christians that, like a night Christian that doesn't share their faith and show their light. So he came at night. And secondly, why did he come? Have you ever thought that Nicodemus may have been suffering just a bit too much religion, a bit too much church? Because that's what was probably wrong. He had spent all his life tied up with religion tied up with all this, these laws and he was just totally involved with that and it would, it would have been almost freeing for him to go to Jesus and not have to worry about all these laws and rules and so he came to Jesus at night and yet when Jesus talks about the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the New Testament they're not very nice things, he called them um, yeah, snakes, brood of vipers he had nothing good to say about them because he knew their hearts, he saw in their hearts he didn't see anything good in their hearts he saw the outside and then he looked on the inside and he didn't like what he saw because they were just doing things for themselves doing things for each other, to please each other they worshipped their temple and they worshipped the Lord and you know I often once again look around the world today and see so many people worshipping their church and worshipping their, their, their system that they've got and there's no outreach and there's no growth. And that's what was happening back in Jesus' time. And you can read Isaiah, the very first chapter of Isaiah, where God comes down hard on the church at that time, saying, I don't like the fact that you're just doing all this worship, you're doing all this sacrifice, but unfortunately it's nothing to me because of your hearts. And it's no different today. As we come 
to church. God looks at our heart. He looks on the inside. And I'm, I'm praying that he likes what he sees, and I'm sure he does tonight. And so Nicodemus comes at night. He came because he was searching. He was really searching, just like Zacchaeus was a few weeks ago. The church wasn't giving him any answers. And I pray that that's another thing we can think about, that the church will give the answer. That our church can be a church that gives answers to people that are lost. You know, we can't solve all the problems of, of the South Coast. You know, when I first became a chaplain, I remember it, at Narica, I was just so passionate about primary school and high school and teenagers. And unfortunately, our church was able to focus in on that. But, you know, every church that become, as I move into this church, ECF, I want to know over the next year what our passion is, what our drive is. I'm sure it's not going to be primary school, high school, teens, and everything else, but it's going to be one, it's going to be something. And we're going to find that passion and that drive. And when we work for the Lord, it's not going to be hard work because we're going to be doing His work and we're going to be doing something for the kingdom. And I know over these next months and years that we're going to know, we're going to find out what our passion is, what our drive is, where God, what God wants to do to us at ECF, where He wants to lead us. And as we ask, is the church giving the answers? I've decided, the uh, first little thing I'm going to do over the next few months is I'm going to get some booklets. Because I know at my previous church, when people came in, I always made sure I had some booklets and stuff for them. And I was just getting ready to do all this at Google, but I'm going to do it here now. And one of them is called Why Jesus. It's one of the, it's from the Alpha Course and Nikki Gumbel. And it's one of the best explanations of why you need Jesus. And then we've got a New Testament, the book of Luke. And it just, it's just the book of Luke. And at the back, it explains the gospel story and just a prayer at the back how to become a Christian. And I think that's going to be a great start so we, as we bring our friends and we have a table with resources, we'll be able to give one of these, or both of these, to people as they come in the door that don't know Jesus. And that's a start. So we're going to be helping people. The church will be giving answers. This church will be giving answers to people who are lost, as Nicodemus was. So Nicodemus comes and he meets Jesus. And he gave him the rightful recognition when meeting him. But he didn't even have time to ask a question because Jesus just got right to the point. And he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And in all sincerity, Nicodemus replied, but how can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? Because that's all he could think of. How can I be born again? It doesn't work out. He just didn't understand it. And Jesus answered, he said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. And as we look at the Greek words here, we look at the Greek word for water, which is hydatos. And it basically means water as in rain, as in refreshing rain, a cleansing rain. So when you think about that, that when Jesus comes into our life, the hydatos, the refreshing rain, cleanses everything. You know, it's just like when I leave my car out the rain, it's any time it gets a wash. It gets cleansed, it gets clean. And the harder the rain, the cleaner it gets. And that's just what Jesus was saying. He was saying... That there, was, um, that there was water was required, the cleansing, so we needed to clean, we needed to remove the past, wash it away, and start afresh, and then allow the spirit, which in, in the Greek means pneuma, the word pneumatic. And it means a current of air or a breath, or Christ's spirit or Holy Spirit. It's got quite a lot of meanings. That's the Greek meaning. So a current of air or breath, Christ's spirit and Holy Spirit. So then we have the water, the cleansing, and then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming in, the current of air coming into our life, the wind coming into our life and taking over. That's what Jesus was asking Nicodemus. To put aside the past, all the law, all the temple stuff, and just to put all that aside, wash it away, and then ask the Holy Spirit to come into his life to work in his life in a diff totally different way to how he was. Not worrying about all the 300 laws, just worrying about what Jesus said. And, worrying about, and allowing the Holy Spirit to work into his life to become a different person. One writer said, Jesus knew that regeneration was something that God prompts, not man. Okay? Regeneration was something that God prompts, not man. But religion, which is what Nicodemus was about, is something that humans prompt, not God. So you've got regeneration coming from God and religion coming from man. So with these spiritually blind eyes, Nicodemus couldn't get his mind around the concept of this spiritual rebirth. 
Jesus knew that only the work of grace through the power of the Spirit could open his spiritual eyes. He was so locked up in the law. People are so locked up into their lifestyle and often into their church routines that they can't see clearly what Jesus is trying to do in their life through the act of grace. So to nail this concept home, Jesus tells a story about Moses and the serpent in the wilderness that we just re re reenacted this, this thing. And he says to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness that one we did, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes on him shall have eternal life. And then he went on to say that John 3.16, you know what think about everybody knows John 3.16, but not everybody knows it was actually Jesus was talking to one man, Nicodemus, and yet that verse is going out to everybody in this universe. And he goes on to say to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. The story of the gospel shared to Nicodemus. And so he tells his story. And I can just see Nicodemus thinking about it. He wouldn't know it backwards because the Israeli culture is to tell stories. The fathers to tell the children's stories. And that was one of their favourite stories. The snakes in the wilderness. And so is our young friend over here. He's battling with a snake. You know, it wouldn't have mattered if he was the son of Moses. It wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered if he had a million dollars and paid, paid for the best any in the world. It wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have mattered if he knew every doctor in the whole tribe of Israel. And it wouldn't have mattered if he did fly the tourniquet and, and suck out the blood. It would not have worked for this poor John from the tribe of Judah. He would have died. And yet what did he do? He looked at this, you know, and Moses one probably wasn't much better than mine. He had a snake, he put it on a pole, and he put it in the centre of the camp. And people were coming from all walks of life that had been bitten. And as they came and looked, they were healed in the bite mark when the poison left their body and they were miraculously healed. And I think, wow, what an incredible story. Sorry, I did that again. Sorry, I just knocked it. Is that better? <laughs> Sorry, Margaret. Sorry, everybody. That's twice I've got that tonight. Yeah. So, as they looked at that pole and looked at the snake on it, it wasn't so much that how the snake was made, it wasn't the fact how good the pole was, it wasn't anything of that. It was the fact that they looked in faith and they allowed this act of grace to take place. And so Nicodemus then had to rethink his whole life. You know, he's probably you know, getting on in life. He spent his whole life in church and yet he hasn't got eternal life and he hasn't recognised Jesus as his saviour. We leave Nicodemus there for a while and we go further on the story of Jesus' life. And Jesus does end up dying on the cross as he says there. He died on the cross for everybody. And at that particular time when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us there's a few ladies there, and Mary, and John the disciple, everybody else had left. And then they all leave and the body's taken down. But two men took an incredible risk to take this body to make sure that Jesus got a proper funeral, which was part of the prophecy. Two men. One, Joseph of Arathamina, a rich man. And the other one, Nicodemus. So that's how I know that what happened with Jesus that night, that Nicodemus found eternal life. He found salvation that night because he put the law aside, he put all the rubbish aside from the church and from the temple and said, Jesus, I want to follow you no matter what it takes. You know, if you read history, it's not in the Bible, but if you read history and you look up Nicodemus, many historians say that Nicodemus, Nicodemus died a poor. He was living with his daughter, no money, nothing. I, I would probably believe that because he gave everything up for Christ. I think what an incredible testimony of a man that had everything in the eyes of the world gave it all up for Jesus because he saw the truth in Jesus' message.
Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it does, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it. Nicodemus chose not to love his life. He chose to love Christ. Yes, he lost his earthly life and lost a lot of possessions, but he gained eternal life. And so my question this afternoon is, as we think of the story of the, the Old Testament story of the mistakes in the wilderness, and when the pole was lifted up, how people were cured. And then we see the story of Nicodemus, how his life was trans, transformed in an instant with his contact with Jesus, because he said yes to Jesus. He asked for a washing, a complete cleansing, and then he, the Holy Spirit came into his life and turned his life around. Has there been a time in your life where if you have asked God to wash you clean, to remove the old life, to enable the Holy Spirit to come into your life? That's what that rebirth, that's what the regeneration is all about. That's what it means to be born again. Nicodemus experienced it. I pray most of everybody here has experienced it as well because that's the only way we can enter the kingdom of heaven. It's the only way we can have eternal life is when we say yes to Jesus, no to the world, accept that cleansing and then allow for the Holy Spirit to start working in our life. So I pray that as we listen to the story tonight, firstly, thank God if you've made that decision. If you haven't, I pray that later on in the service we will pray that prayer so you can make a decision for Jesus. And finally, that we continue to pray for the lost in this world, our family, our friends, our neighbours, to continue to pray for that regeneration. Not the religion, but the regeneration that comes in people's lives. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the story of Nicodemus. Lord, I thank you for the way that you touched his life. A man full of religion, full of importance, in the eyes of the world, a special man. And yet, Lord, you saw into his heart and saw it was empty. And Lord, I thank you that he recognised that story in the Old Testament of when the snake was put on the pole and as people that were bitten looked up, they were healed instantly. And I thank you, Lord, that by your grace, we can look up to the cross the very same way we can look up to the cross. Receive forgiveness and receive new life. And while all heads are bowed, I just ask if, you just, um, if you're not praying just to look to the floor. I just want to ask you, please, in, the, in your heart of hearts, do you know for sure that you have made this decision to follow Jesus? Do you know for sure that if something happened to you tonight, that you would be in heaven with Jesus? And if you're not sure, I just want you to raise your hand right now and just show me and I can pray for you. And praise God, there's no hands. So. But I want you to pray this prayer anyway. If, if you even put your hand up, just pray while we're not out loud, just in your heart. And just pray, Father God, I recognise myself as a sinner, as a person that's fallen short of your grace and, and I'm short of things that I've done wrong. But Lord, I know just as the children of Israel were able to look to that snake, and as Nicodemus could look to the cross, Lord, I, I, I look to the cross tonight. I ask you to get rid of my old life. I pray forgiveness for my old life. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life to start afresh. And Lord, I pray for that water, the refreshing, the hudatus to come through me right now. And then I also ask for your spirit to fill me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing our closing song.